This morning we are continuing a sermon series entitled, Who's Who? On Our Way to the Cross. And so we're looking at individuals who played a a major role in those last days and in the last week of Jesus' life. We've already looked at the woman who anointed Jesus in Bethany. Um, And so we have an alabaster jar to signify her part. We have a a coin purse to signify Judas, whom we looked at last week, and how um, uh, for 30 pieces of silver, Judas handed over Jesus to the Romans and to the Jewish leaders. And today we we have a a rooster crowing to symbolize Peter. And I actually think we have a slide to show these three objects, because if you're you're like me and you're in the back row, you probably can't see them very well. So those are our objects on the altar today. Now this week, I think it was uh, during staff meeting, I asked anybody, so does anybody have a rooster? And they said, well, we don't have any rooster. But then it dawned on me, Cecil Dixon. Um, I don't know if you know Cecil, he's here. But Cecil has a collection of about 7,400 chickens and roosters. And so I called Cecil up, and so um, he obliged me and has let me borrow a couple roosters today. So I appreciate that, Cecil. Um, But yeah, just what a a great opportunity just to sit down and talk with Cecil a little bit. So today we, we are looking at Peter. Now, our text comes from the Gospel of Matthew, but I want to set up our text just a little bit for us today. It's the Thursday, the night before Jesus' death. It's the night before he will be crucified. It's the, it's the place is the Garden of Gethsemane. And an overwhelming force has come to the Garden to arrest Jesus. We're told that there are Roman soldiers. We're told that there are police officers from the Jewish government. We're told that Judas is there. And if you were here last week, you you know that that right uh, before this, Satan had entered Judas. And so Judas is as deadly as any of those other people there. He's just as deadly as the police or the soldiers. I mean, this is an epic battle of good versus evil. So this overwhelming force has gone to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. I kind of think of those police shows or those movies where the SWAT team has to go in and and raid a house, you know? And they've got their riot gear on and they're all armed. And they come with an overwhelming force. And there's always that informant that has to go up and knock on the door, right? That's got to be the worst job ever. I want to be behind the SUV with, you know, with the shotgun, but no, there's always that guy that goes to the front door. I mean, who volunteers for that? Well, on this Thursday evening, it's, it's Judas. It's Judas. And they're in the garden. And this overwhelming force comes, and, and Judas goes to Jesus. And as a sign of greeting, and, a, and as a sign of betrayal, Judas kisses Jesus on the cheek. From there, they, they, take, they take Jesus to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was kind of the, the supreme court of Israel. The highest judicial body for the Jews. It was made up of 70 men, inclu- including the, the high priest, who at that time was Caiaphas. And their job, their role was to uphold the scriptures. Their job was to look at the Torah, the the first five books of the Bible, and rule according to God's word. But in this night, they're going to do everything but that. They're not going to listen to God. They're not going to pay attention to the scriptures. The Bible tells us that on this night, they will actually actively seek for false evidence so that they could put Jesus to death. It is a mockery of the judicial system. Jesus will not receive a fair trial. The writing is on the wall. The trial, again, takes place in the temple in the Sanhedrin. And so while the trial is taking place inside the walls, We're told that Peter is just outside the walls in the courtyard. And that's where we pick up our story today from Matthew, chapter 26, beginning with verse 69. 
Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also are with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. So in our text, three times, not once, not twice, three times Peter denies knowing Jesus. Which, if you know about Peter in the Bible, is contrary to, to Peter's character. Peter, before, had never really shied away from confrontation. Peter was not afraid to mix it up a little bit. Elsewhere in the Gospels, we're told, on that night when Jesus was arresting, remember that overwhelming force that came to arrest Jesus? In the midst of all that, we're, we're told that it was Peter who actually drew his sword and was ready to fight them all. He actually cuts the ear off of the high priest's servant. His, the servant's name was Malchus. He, he cuts his ear off. I mean, that's kind of who Peter is. Jesus who told Peter put, to put his sword away and, and then Jesus miraculously heals the servant guy's ear. It's Peter who, who is willing to try and walk on water on one, on one stormy evening as they were out in the Sea of Galilee. I mean, Peter's like, you know, let me try. I, I can walk out to you, Jesus. It's Peter who at one point takes Jesus aside and says to Jesus, Jesus, you got it all wrong. Because Jesus had been teaching to them, you know, I must suffer, I must die. And so Peter takes him aside and says, no, if you're the Messiah, you're not going to suffer. I mean, this is who Peter is. He's not one to, to shy away from confrontation. But here are three things. Three times he denies knowing Jesus. Three times he basically says, just, just leave, leave me alone. So, I mean, what is up with Peter? You know, I, I look at my own life, and I, I do not enjoy confrontation. I'm not one of those people who seeks confrontation. Now, I'm sure we all know people who are like that. We know, you know, we all know a Peter or two who kind of seek out confrontation. But I don't enjoy confrontation. Just yesterday, I was with three of my kids, and we were going down to my parents' home in Plymouth, and we stopped at McDonald's. <laughs> now, I'm not a huge McDonald's fan, but I do love their Cokes. So I wanted me a large Coke from McDonald's. I actually still remember the order. We were getting two large Cokes, two large sweet teas, a 20-piece McNugget, and two small fries. That was our order yesterday. And my first mistake was going through the drive-thru. <laughs> just not, it's just not a good thing when you're going to McDonald's. So I place my order. I go to the first window. I pay for my order. I go to the second window. The first thing the guy does, and he's a teenager, First thing the teenager does is give me two medium Cokes. But you've been down to the same price. I mean, whether it's a medium or large, it's still a buck. So if it's the same price, you know, I, I want my large. I ordered a large. But again, I'm not a big confrontational guy, but, but I said to him, I said, well, we ordered, we ordered larges. He said, well, on the, on the ticket, it says it's a medium. <laughs> and I said, well, if it's not too much of a problem, we'd like larges. At which point he says to me, he says, well, actually, I am backed up a little bit in here. <laughs> and I'm almost ready to go and say, okay, just give us the mediums. But then I look at my kids, and they're giving me that look like, Dad, we want the largest. 
So I say, I said, well, we'd really prefer the largest. He said, okay. And so he made us go forward and wait. <laughs> so we had to go and, and wait. But I'm telling you, I almost felt bad about ordering the large and, and asking for the large. You know, I don't, I'm not a big person who likes confrontation. But having said that, there are times... There are times when you just got to do what you got to do, right? I mean, we all have those buttons that can be pushed. When we truly believe it's worth it. My family and I, we were on vacation a few years ago and we went to New York City. And on this day, we parked in Jersey first, which was probably our first problem, right? <laughs> that was the first mistake. But we parked in Jersey and took the train into New York City. But when I, when, I, when I parked, there was a sign that said, all day parking, $30. For that, that wasn't too bad. Now on another trip, on a side note, on another trip, we actually found parking like three blocks from Times Square, 20 bucks, all day parking. We didn't have anything stolen. The car didn't come back with extra dents. It was awesome. But here we parked in Jersey. There was a sign. $30 all day parking. We go back that, that night. We're one of the last ones back. There may have been two vehicles in the entire parking lot. That sign I saw early in the morning was gone. <laughs> so I went up to pay, and I had my $30 on the counter. He said, oh, it's going to be $60. At which point I think, I'm thinking to myself, I'm getting ripped off. <laughs> right? Again, I don't like confrontation, but if I think you're lying to me, if I think you're cheating me, if I think you're ripping me off, okay. So I said to him, I said, well, hey, there was a sign when we came in. It said $30 all day parking. He said, I can't do anything about that. It says $60. I, say, I said to him, I said, can I have the number of your manager? He said, I am the manager. <laughs> You've been there before, Right? <laughs> So I, don't, I think I was delirious, crazy, and temporary insa insanity maybe was my plea. But it's after midnight. We're in Jersey. Who knows what kind of, you know, handgun this, this guy has behind the counter. But as I'm standing there at the window, I look over, and I see this key rack, and there are my keys. And I had this instant idea. I could probably get to my keys before he could. Just... <laughs> right inside the window, right? It's right there. My 30 bucks is on the counter. Now the funny thing is, I didn't say a word, but you know how you can see someone thinking about something? He looks at me, and the next thing I know, he's taking those keys off the shelf because he knows exactly what I'm thinking. At that point, what do you do? So I paid my 60, you know, I paid my $60, but man, I, I, I really didn't want to, and and man, when you think someone's ripping you off, I mean, sometimes you have those buttons that are pushed. Sometimes it's worth it for a little confrontation. So for whatever reason, on this Thursday night, Peter decides, you know, it's just not worth it. I'm not one of his followers. Not only that, but I, I don't even know the guy. Why, why don't you all just leave me alone? Now, I read this morning from the Gospel of Matthew, but, uh, but the Gospel of Luke, ah, I mean, Luke adds a detail that, that I just can't overlook. Luke adds a detail that just, just nags at me. Because in the Gospel of Luke, Luke tells us, Peter denies Jesus three times, right? And after the third time, a rooster crows. Well, according to the Gospel of Luke, after the denials, after the ro rooster crows, Presumably, Jesus, Jesus, the trial's over. The Sanhedrin's 
um, done. At the moment the rooster crows in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus has walked out of the temple into the courtyard. Into the courtyard. And in the, and in the, the, the light of the, the, the flicker of the flames, the fires, it tells us he walks out of the temple into the courtyard, and as soon as the rooster crows, crows, as soon as Peter has denied him three times, he looks straight into the face of Peter. And I wonder, what was in that look? I mean, as kids, we've all gotten the look from our moms, right? Or sometimes you'll be talking with someone and they're like people who like stress eye contact and so they just look at you with eye contact and they don't look away and then it becomes a little uncomfortable so you look away. Don't, don't you think Peter looked away that day? But what do, you, what do you think was in the look, in the look of Jesus? What do you think was on Jesus' face as he stepped out of the trial and by this time he's already been you know, beaten and bruised, and so his face is is swollen. Maybe there's some blood trickling down his nose or his lips. He walks out of the temple and looks Peter straight in the face. What was in that look? I just, I want to close this morning by, by, um, by just sharing what Pastor Ray Pritchard thinks that Peter saw in that look. There were kind of three three layers to the look. First of all, Pastor Ray Pritchard said that there was a a conviction in the look. It was a a convicting look. A look that would say to Peter, Peter, did, did I not tell you you would do this? Did I not warn you? Haven't you been with me for these past three years? Haven't you seen my miracles and heard me preaching? Look at me now. Do you not know me? Do do you not know me? Look of conviction. But Pastor Ray Pritchard also says there was probably a look of compassion, right? Peter, Peter, if only you would trust me. If only you would lean on me. If only you would believe that with me all things are possible. Don't try to do it on your own. Peter, just believe. A look of, a look of compassion. Pastor Ray Pritchard also suggests there is a look of commission, a, a commissioning look. We're told that that Peter weeps after Jesus looks at him, that he wept bitterly. And so maybe there's a a look of commission on Jesus' face. Jesus looking at Peter, suggesting this idea, okay, okay, Peter, you know, I I, I get it. I I know you're weeping, and there are times when it is appropriate to weep. But the rooster crows, and it's a brand new day. So I want you to go out and I want you to strengthen your brothers and your sisters. Be the cornerstone I have called you to be. And so as we travel to the cross, as we travel to the empty grave, let us us know in our hearts that Christ is looking at us. And it's a look of conviction. We have all sinned and fallen short. We have all denied Christ at times. But it's also a look of compassion. Don't try and do it on your own. I am with you. Through me, all things are possible. Lean upon me. And then there's the look of commissioning. You're going to have hard days. You're going to have moments when you weep and weep bitterly. But no, a new day is coming. The rooster will crow. And I want you to go to my people and tell them about me. I want you to go to your brothers and sisters and share with them the good news that I give to you. Go and make disciples to change this world. A new day. A new dawn. To look at Jesus. 
in the face. Would you please pray with me? Most gracious God, we do thank you for your love and, and for your grace. We come as sinners in need of Satan. We know that when you look at us, you do have compassion. If only, if only we would turn back. If only we would humble ourselves. Because you are faithful and ready to welcome us back. But God, may we, may we be the church in the world. We may be commissioned to, to go out and be the hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus to whomever we meet. We thank you for this new day, for the dawning of what you are preparing for us. We thank you for all these things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand with me as we join together in our closing song? Mm-hmm.